my pleasure. Uh, I would like to start by asking you about your upcoming shows. You're doing uh, four nights in a row, starting in San Diego, Anaheim on Friday, San Francisco on Saturday, Sunday in Napa. Mm -hmm. Do you? What do you do to stay in shape for a, a run of shows like this, or is it the shows themselves that get you in shape? Well, there certainly is a, a bit of that, but I um, and I have been, I, I, you know, I do fall off. I have I have a lot of work this week to get myself sort of prepared for it. It's um, there are certain songs that these songs are. Um, as a guitar player, particularly, you'll there are parts where you play exactly the same thing for eight minutes, so your hand never moves. So, you, so it's really easy for your hand to get a cramp. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the idea of playing guitar for eight minutes is not, you know, even, you know, you could do, but it's it's a, uh, you know, if you're in one position, right, and it's yeah. So anyway. I have to sort of work it. I, I also I just I was trying to fix a window, and I don't know. How, it's almost like I hit my head, my finger with a hammer. It's got like a blood blister on. It. Oh no! So uh, the band uh, Remain in Light. How how did this start? Is this uh, did you plan on this being a big deal that you would go on tour and and uh, on the road? Yes, yeah, so I think that Adrian and I, our friendship has has sort of you know never went away. Put it that way since we met in you know in, i don't know 1979 or so, something like that and uh, i think a lot of it has to do with that adrian had moved to lake geneva wisconsin he had lived you know he's always lived, he lived in uh, nashville and cincinnati and then springfield illinois and then he moved to there was a, a fantastic recording studio that had been originally built by playboy records when they had the playboy resort in lake geneva wisconsin when Playboy was based out of Chicago. And it still has two great golf courses there, but they had sold the resort. It was a very funky resort, but the studio was still there. And there was this diamond dealer from Chicago named Ron Fagerstein, who just put bought all the best equipment. It was the largest SSL console in the world. It was it had four tape machines, two digital and two Studer A hundreds in one room. It was as you know. It was maybe more well outfitted than any city of Nashville, L.A., New York, or for a single studio. Probably in those places where they had multi studios, if they brought all their equipment in, they would have more. But it's like one, like you walked in, it just had whatever you wanted, and it was you know a little so out of the way that it wasn't booked all the time. So he moved there, and his he had an engineer, uh, Rick. I'm trying to remember his name who then became one of the house engineers there. But, uh, and I grew up in Milwaukee and I, I started going back. My father died suddenly and my mother um, had cancer. So I started living in Milwaukee and that's where I made Casual Gods. And I was coming back to make um, uh, Walk on Water and I was gonna go into a studio and it wasn't finished. But I, but I had been doing things down in Lake Geneva. I, I, I worked with the Bodines down there and, and various other projects. So I'd see Adrian down there, which was about an hour or so from Milwaukee. So we would see each other regularly, and he would usually play on some of these projects and play it on all of my solo records. And so then, you know, he'd come through town with King Crimson or with, you know, the Bears or something like that, and I'd try and go see him. And I was then going, he had moved to Nashville, and I went down to Nashville. And when we, we'd have dinner, we'd talk about the YouTube video from Rome 1980 and i've always thought it was really interesting how that's how it's different than stop making sense um which of course i'm now infinitely infinitely more familiar with stop making sense than i have been because i've been working on the remixing of, of that and the restoration of the film and things like that so but you know that 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 show is more it's basically based largely on speaking in tongues there's only two songs from the remain in light album done on it and, and so I thought, and it was just, it was just a, it was a, it was a different um, feel to the show from 1980. And we said, like, could we possibly use that as a blueprint to go out and do a show like that? So we kind of toyed with the idea of um, 
sort of using studio musicians or various ones. He he had been doing a lot of these uh, uh, remembering David Bowie shows. Uh, but I had then produced this band Turquoise, who were ex really influenced by Talking Heads and sort of new Talking Heads songs. I'd always play a Talking Heads song with them. And I said, I think I really have the solution, which is these guys are great musicians. They are, have real familiarity with the material. And they're a working unit, you know. They've already worked on all those things, like who will share a bedroom? Who, if That's they're right. on a bus, who wants to be on the top bunk and who wants to be in the middle of who? You know, all those things that, when you put together a new group of people, have to be worked out and sometimes don't get worked out and they end up being a big headache. So, we, uh, we, we Turquoise was doing a show at the Exit Inn in uh, Nashville and I flew out there and Adrian and I went and after about one song, Adrian went, went, yep, I think you're right. These guys could do it. So we had a rehearsal and then the pandemic happened. So it was all really planned for 2020. And so then we've been doing over the, over the next couple of years, we sort of did the shows that were being booked in 2020. And uh, then, but this year, you know, or 2022 was, a, or actually this year, yeah, 2023 has been a very busy year. Well, I think, after these four shows, we'll have done nearly 50 shows. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, how, yeah. how many members, uh, the band uh, Remain in Light is 11 piece. Yes. How many, how many uh, of those folks are from the Turquoise? Um, eight. Wow. No, I think eight. So um, there's Adrian and Julie. Um, Julie from, from Adrian's Power Trio. And then we have a percussionist and then me. So at seven, you know, who are not. Yeah. And so, we, you know, and also what's, what's also fun about it is, of course, that Turquoise had a horn section. So, we, you know, Talking Heads, though we toyed with playing, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> Lenny Pickett, who leads the uh, Saturday Night Live band, um, had done stuff particularly on Naked. And also we had Angel Fernandez, so we used horns once in a while, but it's great to have a horn section and to add that to the feel of the, of the music. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like working on the uh, Stop Making Sense anniversary? Sure. <clears throat> well, it was, it started with while we were on tour, <clears throat> Eric Thorngren was working with actually an engineer that had come from Milwaukee and has a studio in LA named David Henze. And they started working on it. And then when I got off the tour in June, I went immediately to LA to sort of finalize the, the you know, the multi-channel Atmos mixes for surround sound rooms. And then we went over to uh, what had been Warner Hollywood, which was, um, Actually, where we mixed Stop Making Sense in 1984, which is amazing. We went back to almost the same room. And uh, it's now called The Lot. And a guy who, this was a, through Gary Getzman, who was the producer of the film, brought in this guy, Mike Minkler, who then sort of adjusted the mix, but made sure that it really, you know, read really well in a, bi in a big room, which you just can't always know when you're in a small room. You know, where, where we were working originally, you know, say the speakers are four or five feet from you and here they're 30 feet from you. Things things are a little bit different then. And so anyway, it really worked out great. The sound is amazing. And of course, we found the original negative in, in a warehouse in Nebraska, which was apparently that MGM owns, which was very, or, or Kansas, I think. I can't remember if it's Nebraska again. But anyway, it's like, so the the new scan looks beautiful, and I've also um, we're thinking of there's three more songs that we will either have as a bonus track or maybe cut into the film that we just were down in L.A. remixing for when we have a uh, I think we're going to put out like a sort of collector's Blu-ray version of it, which will have you know, I don't know notes pictures, yeah for the obsessed for the the true fan the obsessed fan <laughs> yeah now, did you go into like imax theaters to yes listen to the mix and would we tweak it after you'd see it at the 
Um, yeah, well, there, there, IMAX is is a different format than Atmos. Atmos is the Dolby format, um, and so there there is a conversion process between Atmos and Dol and Dolby that is relatively automatic, but there were there were some small adjustments to make. Yeah, I bet it's I bet it's beautiful to watch. It's beautiful, and it is it's. You know, there's sort of I sort of feel there's two ways to really enjoy it. One is go to a theater with the best sound system and possibly, you know, it's it's in IMAX where everything is so big. It's like you're you know, you're having to kind of move your head around to sort of pick up on everything that's going on. And, and the stadium seating there is like everyone can look at it, but it doesn't make it. Um, it's a little bit sort of not conducive to dancing because you're on a pretty steep <laughs> slope. And then there are the theaters a lot of times that don't have every speaker that Atmos would want. A lot of times they they can't really mess up their ceilings to put in ceiling speakers. But then people are dancing. Uh, we, w My wife and I went out to the Milwaukee Film Festival and there were, I think I introduced five screenings of the, of the film. And there was, you know, there was the sort of Saturday night at eight o'clock one where people were like doing a conga line down the aisle and just, you know, you know, I mean, and, you know, not always watching cause they're coming up the aisle too, you know, like later on, but just having so much fun with it. And it's, it's, it's a great experience both ways. Cause ones you can like, Oh, I never saw this or, Oh, look at, you know, I, it's amazing that I've seen it so many times now, but I'll catch, like a glance between, say, Bernie and Alex that I had not caught before. That, that you know, it just happened in a flash of a second. You know, that's sweet. How did you uh, develop your chops as a producer? Well, I think that it seemed to me that like, like when the Talking Heads was over, yeah, you had a career as a producer and just hit the ground running. If, if I'm correct on that. I had produced a few things while in the talking head, so that had begun before that. Um, I think being in, the, just making the, the talking heads records, and you know, sort of seeing the experimental approach that sort of Brian Eno sort of embodied, was was sort of uh, freeing because Brian's view of the recording studio was that it was an extension of your instrument or. It was another place to make sounds or music or th things like that. And, you know, let's try hooking up this machine to this machine to this machine to this machine and see what happens, so to speak. And so I um, I, I then uh, got asked to produce Nona Hendrix, actually our mutual hairdresser, Mary Lou Green, who also dated Robert Fripp. And, would, and she and I were pretty good friends. And... Uh, she and Robert came over to dinner with my girlfriend at the time. And she said, I think you should work with Nona. And so I produced this song, uh, a couple songs with, with Nona. And uh, Buster Jones, who I was hanging out with, I had been down in Philadelphia with him making his record at Sigma Sound. So I was just being around studios and I actually asked him to help on this because I felt sort of, Oh my God! And then I was like, "Okay, I I can do this." And so then I I did um I st I started working on a solo record and being in the, uh, you know I had done the red and, and I had done the then I did the red and the black I guess was, was next, and that I kind of produced myself. Um, you know, I, obviously when you have great engineers, they do make suggestions that a producer might make too. Or you, if you trust the other musicians, that's, I think that when Talking Heads started to produce itself, we sort of, one of us, each of us would act as the producer when the other person was playing. And you, and you get in, you just get sort of free to feel that you can think about the music and, and, and make suggestions. Mm -hmm. So I did, a, I did the, a, a few things mid, mid, you know, I did the Violent Femmes record. I did the Bodines. I did, I worked with the Fine Young Cannibals. Um, I did this band, It's Immaterial, and had a hit song, although I in a fit of uh, a peak because they did not use the mix that I 
liked. I said, well, take my name off of that. Well, that was really stupid because it was a top 10 record in England. It was very stupid of me. I, I yeah. kind of learned the lesson. It was like, you know, but uh, it was, so I had some success with it. And so then when Talking Heads basically really became, you know, was working less and less, you know, we kind of slowed down and then we stopped. It was, um, and, and I was, the other thing that happened is that I really enjoyed putting the band Casual Gods together, but it was something that I had to put my, I put my own money into help keeping it on the road. And it was just sort of like, I can't afford to do this every time. And I don't know how long it's going to take for me to build an audience that could support this. And it was right when my I had met my wife and we started having children. So she she also was influential. It's like you're really good at producing and you can be at home then. Uh, and then I had and then I had like the actually the best year of my life of my production career because I did both the Crash Test Dummies and Throwing Copper in the same year. And that was uh pretty great. The band live. They were huge. Yeah. And I, you know, I helped, I mean, Gary Kerr first who had Radioactive Records was talking its manager. And Phil Schuster had identified this band as having talent. And so Gary sent me down to Washington, D.C., I think to the 930 Club to see them play. He goes, if you, if you want to produce them, I'll sign them. So it was funny. There were other people that were interested in them. And I took them out to dinner. I watched the show, and I really liked them. And I said, well, what are you guys doing now? He goes, they go, well, we're driving back to York. And I said, well, I'll just go with you. So I kind of, I don't know, I, I can't remember if I had to like lie on top of the equipment in the van or there wasn't very much room. I went back and got a hotel. I said, why don't we try and do a rehearsal? So we did a rehearsal and I called, so I called Gary Kerpers. I said, I think they're great. I think we should do this. And I said, so let's, let's do this to them. And they go, when? I said, how about three weeks from now? Which was like, it was like, you know, they were like thinking it's a year, six months or something like that. And there was interest from this record company. But I think the instantaneous nature of it was very, very was really positive, you know. And and so they drove up to Milwaukee because I had this studio that I had been working in where I made Casual Gods. And we recorded it there on a very, very um, uh, small budget. But I mean, I found an inexpensive hotel that they each had their own a little bit, almost like a little suite. It was like really where it's almost like like a lot of uh, it was sort of like a an apartment building where pe like people would retire to. They mm -hmm. served breakfast every morning, and you know there was a little kitchenette in in each of the rooms, and you know. You guys are on a major label. You get your own room now. Yeah, but you know, but the thing is, is the cost. You know, each room costs like a thousand dollars a month. <laughs> Uh, so you know so compared to going to a hotel it was like and uh anyway so we so we made so we made mental jewelry there and then when we came to making throwing copper we went up to pachyderm up in off of, in minneapolis which was a great studio i mean my, my, the biggest thing i said is like wherever we record you guys have to be able to drive there i don't want to spend any money on rent -a cars and I also don't want, I want there to be enough cars if someone ne needs to get away from each other, that it's not like the car is missing. They can get in their car and drive and cool off and then come back. Did that happen much? With well, you know, yeah. it happens. In every, there's, it, people, let's face it, it. If you feel like your ideas are not being listened to or it's someone or you're bored because someone's taking so long to do something, having the ability to sort of get some fresh air is a good idea. Yeah. I have a question for you is how did the uh, switch over from analog to digital affect your role as a producer? I was a pretty early adapter of digital um, and uh, particularly a very early adapter of Pro Tools. Okay. Um, even when it didn't really sound as good, you know, as good as it does now, particularly. Uh, I felt that I was very often taking young and up and coming bands who had great ideas, but were sometimes had not grown into being great players. So that the idea of being able to, uh, and I would not, this is not true at all of live, they played great, but there were places, there were bands that needed help. Mm -hmm. 
And the ways of doing it in the past where you edited tape and things like that, that were very cumbersome and limited what they could do. And so I was, a, you know, I was an early explorer of what you could accomplish with Pro Tools. Um, and, you know, I liked, you know, this also comes out of, you know, sort of what we did with Eno. It's like we, there you, we, there was very much taking things like the, the solo and under, in Born Under Punches is little bits of guitar put into what's called a, what's called a lexicon prime time that had a sample and hold function and then pushing a button and releasing it and maybe messing with the speed as it came out. Mm -hmm. in little choppy little little bits right and so there was just a sense of what you could do and then when sort of these these uh more powerful tools came along you could do that even more things it was an extremely fun time to be making records because you know i did things like for instance on the violent femmes album of having a tape of a two inch tape going all the way around the room in a loop and you're holding up reels and trying to maintain the tension <clears throat> and then recording the multi-track onto another multi-track and just things like that that were chat a real like a physical chat how do we do this you know or i want to try and do i want to try and do this how do we do that and uh now it's sort of people are so fast and so easy it it it, it doesn't it a, it doesn't it doesn't feel as experimental because it's it's maybe so easy to do back then if you you know you might have to take a whole day to do something but when you came out and you got you did something that would have been impossible before then you felt really excited by it yeah the, uh, I remember like some of the first times that I would see someone using pro tools and uh if a if a line in a in a vocal was flat they just take that word or line from another piece and just yeah. paste it in there and all of a sudden it's fixed yeah person didn't have to sing it again well i used to, there were some tuning programs there was one called the oh god who, what was it that was like you had to export it into this other program and then you would manipulate it it was the one that sounded the least m manipulated mm -hmm. back then but it was Time bandit was what it was called. You could you could also time expand or contract it. So if the um, there was one album I worked on where the hit song was uh, had my like the guy's melody had moved and changed from when he had sung it originally, mm -hmm. and so when we recorded it, everything about the recording was better than the than the demo, but. The vocal wasn't and i finally took the vocal from the demo and i was able to put it and then expand and contract it so it fit the um the uh the new track because it was and then i think i then i was able to take his new vocal and contract and you know that sounded better and make it match the other one but it was it maybe took a week you know, unfortunately, I, like I had Carl Durfler with me who could keep the rest of the band busy doing things that I could pop in and I would could trust that Carl would have gotten a great performance and stuff like that. Yeah. I was I've been very fortunate having engineers like Carl or E.T. Thorngren or Doug McKean, people that and David Vartani, people who really were good engineers, had good musical ears and were always an, a great addition to the whole process. Yeah, uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the albums you worked on never came out on vinyl; they were uh, CDs yes. only. And now, with vinyl making the comeback, they're putting a lot of records out that were only on CD out on right. vinyl for the first time. I've got a lot of you know I own a record store, so I've got a lot of uh, kids that kids to me, but guys that are, uh, were around like uh, buying the albums the first time, and now they're bringing their children in. Mm. Buying vinyl, and I imagine you see that a lot when you're playing with Remain in Light, where you're looking yeah. at, you're seeing kids, kids forty, yeah. maybe in their forties or so, and then they've got their kids, and everybody's yeah. dancing. It must be very gratifying. Yeah, it's great. It, it's really great. I mean, the 
the the sort of staying power of of, of talking heads has been remarkable. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think we're more popular now than we were certainly a decade ago or twenty years ago. We um, um, and you know, it, the other thing that's been very fascinating about working on on uh, stop making sense is that you get back into the mix and you hear the exactly what each person played and like boy everyone was it's amazing what a tight band that was i mean we were really at the top of our game yeah. it was great and every album expanded musically like the first album it was basically a four-piece group yeah right? and then like maybe the next album you'd add nona hendrix or some yes. a horn player or something and then but yes i i i think that well i think that the first album 77 stands out as it was we hired a, a, a producer who was known for his mastery of recording tony bon jovi who went on to build the power the power station which was you know considered one of the best studios in the country he is actually related to john bon jovi and you know and um there were a whole bunch of engineers that trained under Tony, Bob Clearmountain, Scott Litt, James Farber, Ed Stasium. Ed, Ed was the the main engineer on on seventy seven, but he he was not a he was not a musician. He didn't have any real sense of arrangements or anything like that. So he brought in a guy named Lance Quinn, who was a session guitar player, as a co producer with him. What? <laughs> But that was still at the time where you sort of felt like the musicians, you were like specimens out in the recording room. And then there were these technicians that recorded you. And then when we, what, then studios started to change and you started having larger control rooms and people started to work more within the control room. And of course, working with Brian uh, at Compass Point on the next record, we were, you know, we were spending more time in the control room, and when you know it was, became it sort of shifted how you, how you made how you made music. Um, I do think that, and so I think that we we didn't really add too many other in, instruments on more songs about buildings and food, but it was a lusher production, mm -hmm. and. Uh, on uh, obviously on in fear of music we did have like congas in uh life during wartime but it was really remain in light where we we played almost everything but we brought in where nona hendrix came in and sang and again we had uh percussionists come in and um you know a lot of people because i saw the stop making sense band assumed that all of the people that were in it played Remain in Light, but we actually played all the instruments ourselves. And then we taught everybody what, what we had played and they, you know, used that, sometimes expanded it and things like that. Right. Well, I really want to thank you for talking with us. That half hour flew by. I really, I had so many other things I want to ask you. Uh, what, can I ask you a quick question before we go? Well, have you ever, been bitten, you ever been bitten by a snake? I have not been bitten by a snake, but I've seen them and I've been to the hospital for, by for where people have been bitten by a snake sort of two interesting ones there was a guy in marin this is amazing he was on a unicycle on one of the trails up in nevado and there was someone said there's a lioness down the path you're not about to go down don't go down there with her cub so he went on another one and the snake jumped up and bit his ankle or bit him and the snake's flying around on the unicycle and finally flies off and his fangs are left in his leg. So he calls 911 and they go, well, can you coast down the hill so we can meet you? And he goes, no, you don't understand. I'm on a unicycle, not a bicycle. So they came and got him. That that bite proved not to be, not, not enough venom got into him. Uh, the doctor who, uh, Dr. Matt Lewin, who's, you know, of course, part of this company that I've started, Ophorex, about snake bites, went to, went and advised and said, I think you can wait, hold off on antivenom for a while. And I, I don't think you needed antivenom as it worked out. But then another guy got bit near College of Marin, and it went right into a vein. And it's like, so he, 
he took three steps and he said it was like being on the most intense acid trip. And fortunately, he was able to get to the hospital. And and again, Matt, when he saw him, said, no, don't get... The protocol says give him two vials. Give him four vials. You, he needs a lot right now. And, and thankfully, they listened to Matt. But yeah. it's a... It's a, you know, it's a very expensive thing. It's like anti-venom in the United States can cost sixty to $100,000 for each bite. I know. And you're working at trying to keep the cost down and make That's it. That's right. People. And actually having something that you could carry in your pocket and be ready. I know. And that's what makes you one of the most interesting men in rock and roll, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us. Good luck. I recommend that everyone sees this band remain in light. Uh, don't don't wear yourself out with the San Diego, Anaheim, San Francisco, Napa run. Pace yourself. And... It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. And I can't, I think Napa is going to be very special because it's, uh, the Blue Note is a very, is an intimate theater where everybody is, feels close, feels like they really have a view of the band. It's going to be great, so, you know. So well, I'm looking forward to it. I'll be there. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Thanks. All, All right. Bye-bye. Right.